Raksha Ben, Yogesh Bhai, Professor Sumati Ramaswamy and friends. Welcome to Mani Bhavan today, Mahatma Gandhi's birthday. We are delighted to have Professor Sumati Ramaswamy with us. She is James B. Duke Professor of History and International Comparative Studies and Chair, Department of History, Duke University, U.S. She has written extensively and her latest book is Gandhi in the Gallery, The Art of Disobedience, published very recently by Roli Books. She has created a beautiful digital project, B is for Baku, growing out from the paintings of children who participated in the competitions organized by Mani Bhavan Gandhi Sangrahalay and Gandhi Smarak Nidhi, Mumbai. She is dedicating it today to both the organizations. We appreciate it and are very happy to accept it. Many thanks, Sumati. As we all know, Mani Bhavan is hallowed by Gandhiji's presence. He stayed here between 1917 and to 1934, whenever he visited this vibrant city and Mani Bhavan, this building in Mumbai became the nerve center for Gandhiji's activities during these 17 eventful years. Leaders like Gandhi constitute the moral capital of the humanity. The political map has changed from his times the economic scenario is struggling to absorb the new forces and yet the ethical and moral issues Gandhi raised remain fundamental and the ideals he tried to implement remain very significant. Now Dada Dharmadikari was a freedom fighter and an excellent commentator on Gandhian philosophy called Gandhi the most uncommitted human being as his only commitment was to the truth. Now what is crucial for all of us is that he remains a seeker of truth and a sensitive, wonderful human being, a man rooted in the soil of India and yet a citizen of the world. Gandhi is often perceived as a very serious man, untouched by the bubbles and rubbles of ordinary life and having little concern for arts and aesthetics. However, Gandhi's human touch made the atmosphere around him lively. One of his close associates, Rehana Tayyabji, lovingly remembered that Gandhi in Sevagra used to wake up at four o'clock in the morning, offer his prayers, then go for a walk, and he was surrounded by children. In her words, oh, how he was adored by children, clinging to his shoulders, clinging to his arms, clinging to his legs. She remembered further that he would go into a garden, he would look at the flowers, and he would touch them lovingly. This sensitive Gandhi, this human Gandhi, the man who could laugh with innocent children, and touch flowers lovingly, and who could understand the pain of others is of crucial importance to us. Children effortlessly and tenderly catch glimpses of this Gandhi when they talk about Gandhi or paint or draw Gandhi. We perceive that in the competitions held here, especially in the painting competitions. Now, Sumati has made an in-depth study of these paintings and will certainly tell us more about that. Now for Gandhi, all true art is an expression of the soul. He had his own views on life, beauty and art and his own way to connect them. In 1946, he had said, that why can't you see the beauty of color in vegetables? And then, there is beauty in the speckled sky. But no, you want the colors of the rainbow, which is a mere optical illusion. 
we have been taught to believe that what is beautiful need not be useful and what is useful cannot be beautiful i want to show that what is useful can also be beautiful now gandhi said in 1946 we need to remember that now this gandhi caring to the people and bapu to the people visualizes an egalitarian society based on the principles of non violence and truth he encourages us to think from a different perspective he encourages us to question inequality and sufferings around us and to undertake our own journey in search of truth every age discovers its own gandhi and ours is no different now i request rakshaben mehta chairman gandhi smarak nidhi mumbai to say a few words about our competitions rakshaben dr thakkar yogesh bhai professor sumati ramaswamy and friends for over 40 years gandhi smarak nidhi mumbai in association with manibhavan gandhi sangrahalay has been conducting many competitions over a span of 3 months every year amongst children of various schools of the city on the occasion of gandhi jayanti these competitions are held in four languages hindi marathi gujarati and english more than 6000 students participate enthusiastically in drawing poetry recitation elocution group singing storytelling and one act play competitions of drawing and painting are very very interesting college students and teachers also participate in essay writing competitions in english marathi hindi and gujarati the aim of these competitions is to promote and propagate amongst the very younger generation the thought philosophy and values of mahatma gandhi especially in today's strife torn world gandhi's philosophy and values have gained renewed renewed relevance our former president of both the organizations dr usha mehta scholar and the gandhian to the court has started these competitions on a relatively small scale around 1977 Now this annual event for KG to standard 10 children attracts thousands of enthusiastic participants, aged 3 to 15, from across the city. Our heartfelt gratitude to Professor Sumati Ramaswamy for her successful efforts to showcase the talent of children through the digital art exhibition. B is for Bapu Gandhi in the art of the children in modern India. and for her dedication of the digital art exhibition to both our organizations on the extremely appropriate occasion of gandhi jayanti we are happy to accept it thank you thank you sumati now we very much look forward to hearing you thanks thank you thank you so much i hope you can all hear me Greetings everyone and thank you for joining in. I'm so very glad to be with you this evening from my morning in Durham, North Carolina on this auspicious occasion and I thank Usha, Raksha Ben and Yogesh for inviting me to join you all. There is nothing more gratifying for a scholar and a historian than to be introduced to a brand new archive. that sets her off to explore a completely new uh, and novel problematic about a man who has been analyzed and studied from almost every angle possible this is what happened to me in march 2016 when i was introduced to a rare treasure trove of children's paintings of mahatma gandhi in your midst in mani bhavan So I begin my talk by thanking the trustees of both the Sangrahalaya and the Nidhi for making it possible for me to study these wonderful paintings over the years for my project that is called B is for Bapu which I now dedicate to both the Mani Bhavan Sangrahalaya and the Gandhi Smarak Nidhi and to the child artists of Mumbai who took part in these painting competitions over the years 
and have made me ask new questions as a historian about Gandhi and the history he made. In particular, I want to thank Usha, Yogesh and Raksha along with Maya Dhoipode and Sandhya Mehta for helping me realize my vision for making this amazing collection of images a scholarly resource in sharing with me their thoughts and ideas and in being comrades in spirit on this journey. Two members of the museum staff, Jadav and Vijay, and I hope they are there in person in Mani Bhavan at the moment, they spent considerable amounts of time helping me sort through close to 800 award-winning paintings over a number of months and getting them ready for digitization. My sincere thanks to them for foregoing holidays and staying late and after hours to enable me to complete my work. I also owe enormous gratitude to M.T. Ajgaonkar and Sajeev Rajan for being so welcoming and accommodating my every request with such good grace and good humor. It is also an honor for me to be addressing you all in Mumbai on Gandhi's birthday, although I wish I could have been there in person to share with you on this occasion. I don't have to tell this audience what a special place Mumbai or Bombay, as it was known in his time, was to Gandhi, as Usha Thakur and Sandhya Mehta have demonstrated so well in their book, Gandhi in Bombay published a few years ago. Gandhi characterized Bombay as the first city of India. It was also, as Bhikkhu Parekh notes, his chosen Karmabhumi, the place of action, a site of duty. It was the city from which, where he left in September 1888 for London as a young 19-year-old man and to which he returned as an accredited barrister three years later. In April 1893, having failed to make his mark in India, he once again set out from Bombay, this time for Durban in South Africa, returning some 20 years later to the city to a Mahatma's welcome in early January 1915. As we also know, he continued to visit Bombay numerous times over the next few decades, until July 1946, to preside over numerous events that punctuated the anti-colonial struggle against British rule. What has been less remarked upon in the scholarship is that on several of these occasions, he visited schools and spoke to children, which was actually one of his favorite pastimes, as Usha noted in a few, few minutes ago, but has been little noticed in the scholarship. So to quote from one, exam one example from among many, on 8 December 1925, he addressed the Gujarati National School and insisted, quote, children, you should realize that you came to the school to learn national service. Most of what you study here should be dedicated to the country, end quote. The patriotic boys and girls of Bombay in turn came out in large numbers to hear their Bapu speak and to participate in various events that he organized, especially around the civil disobedience movement of 1930-1931. The children of Bombay also corresponded with him. For example, in response to a request from them for a message to commemorate his birthday in 1929, he wrote, and I quote, the children who live and study in Bombay ought to know that they are but a drop in the ocean of the crores of children in India. Also, they must realize that a large number of these crores of Indian children are only living skeletons. If the Bombay children look upon them as their own brothers and sisters, what are they going to do for them? End quote. Like the city itself, the children of Bombay too appear to have been charged with a special responsibility in the Gandhian world. 
So I think it is a fitting tribute from this point of view as well to look at the work of Mumbai's child artists who responded to the invitation issued by the Sangralaya and the Nidhi over the years to come and paint their Bapu. This too makes the archive of images in Mani Bhavan such an important scholarly and national resource. Now, if you will forgive me, I'll take a couple minutes to share my screen so that we can begin to look at the digital project. I hope you can all see the screen. Great. So Gandhi, as Usha noted, is also undoubtedly the most painted, photographed and sculpted Indian of his time and since, and I have argued this in my recent book that Usha mentioned was published just a couple, a week, a week ago actually, Almost most major artists of India and many abroad have been drawn to paint him, sculpt him, draw him in, on paper, on canvas, in stone, metal, and so on, and in our own times in digital media. Yet what has gone vastly unknown, unnoticed, excuse me, is the fact that Gandhi has also been the subject of the visual attention of children. And this is the starting point of my own work in this project that I have called B is for Bapu. It is difficult for me at this stage of my research uh, to state with certainty when exactly children began to draw and paint Gandhi's image. Given that in his own lifetime, so many adult artists were drawn to paint and draw him and sculpt him, I imagine children too were beginning to do that. But at this moment, I don't have concrete evidence for an exact date. So the challenge for me as a historian is that there's very little documentation prior to the 1950s of the role that children have played in producing artwork around him. In fact, there's virtually no scholarship at all on child art in modern India, and rarely are children's artworks thought worthy of saving and preserving and let alone documenting and analyzing. This is also what makes the archive of children's paintings of Gandhi in Mani Bhavan such an important and precious resource. As Usha mentioned, it is well known that Gandhi did not care for art for its own sake and was impatient with most professional artists who were drawn to him to paint him and sculpt him and photograph him and so on. But drawing, art and craft were given pride of place. In fact, sometimes over reading and writing in his revolutionary ideas on educating the girls and boys of the nation. The Mumbai children whose paintings appear in my project were not educated in Gandhian schools, but they yet they joyfully and playfully and insightfully reveal truths about the Mahatma that I believe he would have appreciated. So what might we learn about Gandhi if we make the image and the child's artwork the starting point of our exploration of the father of the nation? This is the key question that I undertake in this project. And I do so not only from an interest in the art of the child, but also as a historian to underscore the importance of the child in the making of the Mahatma. As Gandhi himself declared in a speech in London in October 1931, and I quote, the greatest lessons in life, if we would but stoop and humble ourselves, we would learn not from grown-ups, learned men, but from the so-called ignorant children. Jesus never uttered a loftier or a grander truth than when he said that wisdom cometh out of the mouths of babes. I believe it. I have noticed it in my own experience that if we would approach babes in humility and in innocence, 
we would learn wisdom from them. So Gandhi perceived children as embodiments of innocent courage and strength and sources of wisdom with lessons to offer for life. All the same, they were also subjected to many of his experiments with truth, nonviolence, civil disobedience, and living life the austere Gandhian way. And we should not forget that. In other words, I hope to not naively romanticize the relationship between Gandhi and the child. He saw himself as many things to them. He was their confidant, their teacher, their playmate, but rarely forgot that he was Bapu, the father. It is also important to remember that by his own admission, Gandhi felt that he had failed as a father of his own four sons, Harilal, Manira, Manilal, Ramdas, and Devdas. He was in fact quite ambivalent about fatherhood and in fact preferred, preferring at times to call himself mother. At the same time, more than other male leaders of his time, as Usha also alluded, quoting Rayana Tyabji, Gandhi spent a lot of time thinking about and addressing issues of specific to childhood, from ch toilet training to their budding sexuality. He wrote extensively to children and spent hours in their company. He openly professed, as I noted, the importance of learning from them, and his writings and speeches have many examples of the lessons he got from hanging out with children. His residences were filled with children of kin and followers alike. Several of his political ethical projects, be they the awakening to racial justice in South Africa, or the use of fasting as a practice of persuasion was also uh, undertaken on account of children. His speeches and writings frequently invoke children of Hindu mythology, such as Parhlad or Shravan, who he held out as exemplars for adults in his generation. Virtues he associated with children, their simplicity, their candor, their mischievousness, their playfulness were held out to adults to imitate. We have all, quote, to aspire after being childlike, he said. We cannot become children because that is impossible, but we can all become like children, end quote. In fact, when he was around children, as many a contemporary noted, he became like a child himself, readily and willingly taking on their persona. As I already noted, he was famously ignored. World-renowned artists who would tra travel to meet him, to draw him and paint him and so on, and was quite impatient with him. And yet he had the kindest of words when a child sent him a drawing or a painting noting on one occasion that he was delighted to receive funny drawings. And another time he wrote from prison to a young girl called Satyavati in 1930, quote, the sketch of a flower pot with flowers standing upright is so good that the flowers seem to emit the fragrance, end quote. So in a similar spirit, I too have chosen in this project to honor the works archived in Mani Bhavan as I draw on them as a historian to look anew at the most famous Indian of his time and since. So at the heart of this project is a digital album and I'm going to switch to the album as you can see here and let me go to full screen. Um, so this is an album in which I have assembled some of these award-winning paintings from this collection. And what I have done is interwoven them with Gandhi's own statements about children over the years, as well as statements written by children to him. And here's a great example. And I have deliberately used handwriting to signal when a child wrote to him. But also I have interwoven with statements that Gandhi made about children, but also letters that he wrote to them and also letters that they wrote to him. So what I have attempted to do in this album is set up what I call a visual dialogue between his words 
and their images in order to understand why the child was so important to Gandhian thought and to practice, but also to understand what the ch child made of Gandhi in their visual imagination. Of course, the children of India are bombarded with images of Gandhi. They see him everywhere, in their school books, in statues on streets, on postage stamps, in currency notes, in wall posters, uh, um, uh, billboards, you name it, they see him. So they do not paint with an innocent eye or with a pure brush. More often than not, their Bahu looks like the Gandhi of the adult artist. And indeed, the topics and themes in the Mani Bhavan competitions are actually proposed by adults to which the children visually respond. And yet, with an inscription here or an insertion there, many of these award-winning wi uh, entries in this very important archive show originality and insight and imagination. The children draw on episodes from Gandhi's life to comment on the present. They comment on climate change, religious violence, Swachh Bharat. They confirm that these matters are of concern to the child as they are to adults. They paint themselves in as witnesses to Gandhi's actions and his politics. They see themselves as recipients of his wisdom, or they also see themselves as participants in his movements. They also see themselves as his companions in these paintings. So the presence of the child in these paintings pushed me as a historian to ask new questions about well-known moments of Indian history, such as the Salt March, also a favorite topic for the painting competitions organized in Mani Bhavan. So let me take you to the Salt March section of the album. And that begins on page 1999. Oh, excuse me. I didn't, I sort of got it wrong. Yeah, so the album has close to 300 pages and you can scroll through it at your leisure. The album will be available on the Mani Bhavan website as well as any, anywhere online. And all the children's uh, 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 credit lines are at the very end of the album, so you can switch to that. But here I want to introduce you to the children's paintings uh, on the Salt March. These child artists, of course, have been inundated with images of the child uh, of the salt march that circulate in India's visual culture. So at one level, there are few surprises in these uh, children's representations of this historic event. Nonetheless, some really interesting and original innovative sentiments enter the picture, so to speak. Sometimes this takes the form of little inscriptions that the child adds to the painting. Like you see here on the right hand side of the screen, uh, if you want something which you never had, you have to do something which you never did. Or if you turn to this painting on the right hand side on page 105, Inkalab Zindabad, Long Live the Revolution, which I'm fairly certain was not actually uttered during the Salt March itself, but the child brings it in. And here's another example. On the left-hand side of the screen, Bapu, you lifted a pinch of salt. With that, the British Raj was finished. And my favorite example uh, is uh, from this page on page 116. And actually there is a zoom functionality which you can also zoom in and look at these paintings in close analysis. I'm not going to do that here in the interest of time, but you can do that. And here's a very wonderful example. First, they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. Then they fight you. Then you won. So such paintings compelled me to ask, what does this most important moment in Gandhi's anti-colonial career look like when the child is thrown into the mix? 
Some years after the event, Gandhi wrote on the 29th of November, 1933, to Manu and Mao, the two young sons of his associate and translator, Valji Desai. Quote, I always enjoyed moving around with children, especially on foot during the Dandi March, end quote. And yet in the vast scholarship on the SALT march, there is virtually no consideration given to children at all. In the days leading up to the start of this historic 241-mile march from Sabarmati Ashram to the Dandi seashore, Gandhi himself vacillated on this matter, despite his later pronouncements to Manu and Mao. A week before he set out, at a prayer meeting on the 5th of March, he declared, quote, in the coming struggle, even children might get killed. Knowing this, if we take children with us, that would be sheer folly, end quote. Women too, as we know, were explicitly prohibited from joining the march. At the end of the first day on reaching Aslali, Gandhi spoke to a crowd of about 4,000, including about 500 women, and once again assumed that only men should be called upon to violate the salt tax. We learn from both oral histories and the memoir of Narayan Desai, who Bapu was, fond, uh, was uh, inclined to call Bablo, the child residents uh, in the ashram clamored to be selected to join the march with him, but to no avail. In the band of 78 marchers whom Gandhi handpicked, there were a handful of older teens, the oldest, youngest of them being 16-year-old Vittal Bai Thakkar. All of this is in contrast to an earlier march, his first one in November 1913 in South Africa, when Gandhi's so-called army of peace included 57 children by his own count, some of them apparently infants in the arms of their mothers who set out with the intention of walking some 20 miles for eight days across fairly hostile territory. But not so in India and 70, 17 years later. Within a few days of being on the road to Dandi, however, Gandhi changed his mind, likely because so many women, many with their children in tow, showed up to greet him and cheer him on his historic pilgrimage. On 15th of March, on reaching the village of Dhaban, he announced, quote, ours is a holy war. It is a non-violent struggle. Even women and children can take part in it, end quote. On 26th March, on reaching Broj or Baruch, he said, quote, he was seeking help, he said, on bended knees from the old and young alike to join his cause. And particularly delighted that so many little girls were writing insistent letters to him demanding enlistment. The day after, in the village of Mangarol, the future salt thief let it be known, quote, even children should openly steal salt. After daybreak on the 6th of April, 1930, when he reached down to the wet earth and picked up a pinch of salt and becoming, he became a lawbreaker in the eyes of the state, Gandhi called upon all Indians, including children, to follow his example. A week later, he declared that whole villages in Gujarat have set out to offer civil disobedience. Men, women, and children are taking part in it. By 27th April, 1930, he was proud to note in a message to America that was published in the Sunday Times that across the country, hundreds of thousands of people, including women and children from many villages, have participated in the open manufacture and sale of contraband salt, end quote. In a message to Navajeevan on the 4th of May, he observed that a seven-year-old Parsi girl had sent money for the cause and that the children of Vapi had collected rupees 300 for the cause. Quote, one little girl among them asked whether she might join the struggle. 
when such innocent children show a desire for service, who can help believing that they are prompted by God? I see no insincerity in these girls, end quote. Gandhi appears to have been particularly tickled by the initiative taken by some children, most likely led by Indira Nehru, a future prime minister, to form the Monkey Brigade, Vanarasena. Renouncing their toys and kites, these young soldiers of Swaraj, as he christened them, some only six years old, were further proof that his was a battle of right against might. Now I confess that if it had not been for these beautiful paintings that I began to analyze by the child artist uh, of Mumbai in Mani Bhavan, I as a historian may likely never have paid attention to all the very many ways in which the child became involved in this most important of Gandhian moments and movements. Or take the example of spinning, which of course I don't have to tell this audience, was a very important Gandhian uh, penchant, as you know. Um, so there's a whole section of this album that I have called Spinning India's Destiny, uh, which of course uh, showcases the paintings done focusing on the spinning wheel. In the large and ever-growing scholarship on Gandhi, much of course has been made of his pension for spinning, but little attention has been placed, uh, has been paid, excuse me, to the place of the child in, in the Mahatma's plans for the spinning wheel, which was crucial. In fact, this child was crucial and constitutive in Gandhi's vision for the spinning wheel and, its, and the manner in which it would salvage the nation. In turn, the ideal child was, the, was a spinning child. With the help of the spinning child, the Mahatma hoped to instill this foundational habit in every Indian household and across the nation. When the child began to spin and made it a daily habit, the destiny of India itself, Gandhi argued, would be secured. For the sake, for the excuse me, for the sake of the spinning child, Gandhi even invested in the development of the beautiful takli or handheld spindle, which he insisted was easy to use, took up no space at all, and produced lots of yarn in virtually no time at all. As early as October 1919, soon after he himself learned how to spin in Mani Bhavan, as legend has it, Gandhi began to call for spinning to be introduced into schools, declaring at various points that if he had his way, he would make it compulsory in the curriculum. In January 1921, he recommended an hour spinning uh, uh, to be uh, taken up in the school curriculum for every child. But within a matter of weeks, he began to urge that four out of the six hours that the child spent in the school should be dedicated to spinning. In April 1922, while he was in prison, he wrote a primer in Gujarati for elementary school kids which supposed that the intended reader child had already spent a year studying spinning. He also hoped that when the primer was published, the little book would include pictures of the spinning wheel. Spinning took precedence over literary training. And at various points, Gandhi argued that through the act of spinning, the child would learn history, geography, as well as mathematics. When he formalized his philosophy of Naitali or new education in 1937, spinning became foundational to the curriculum. Over the years, various nationalist gatherings would be invariably accompanied by spinning competitions and exhibits with prizes given to the child who produced the most and the best. Gandhi's own letters and speeches are filled with accounts of children who wrote to him about their spinning accomplishments or whom he witnessed in the act of spinning. 
To quote one example from many such, he wrote in 1946 of meeting a five-year-old girl called Aruna in Madras, quote, she watched me spin and was seized with the desire to do so herself. In a single day, Aruna had prepared a sliver and brought it to me. Then when she saw me spin that sliver, her joy knew no bounds. I explained to her the defects of the sliver and her parents helped her to remove them. Since then, she has been making slivers and spinning quite well, end quote. In turn, when he wrote his numerous letters to various children who were under his care, he would invariably ask them about the number of hours they spent spinning and scolded them if they reported that they had not met the quota. He praised them for success. His grandson Arun uh, recounts receiving a letter from his famous grandfather dated 17th December 1945, quote, I think of you every day, but especially today during day of silence. Do you spin carefully at least 160 rounds daily? Is the yarn even? Do you yourself fix the spinning wheel? Do you keep a daily count? If you keep this one promise, you will learn a lot. Blessings to all of you from Bapu." End quote. In an earlier decade, writing from prison on the 21st of March, 1932, to the boys and girls of Sabarmati Ashram, he reminded them, quote, spinning is primarily an education for it arouses in us a sense of the duty of service. We learn in it a very useful occupation and there is beautiful art in it, end quote. Speaking in 1925 to the children of the Gujarati National School in Bombay, he asked the children never to forsake the charka. As I noted earlier, as I put together this album, my goal was to establish a visual dialogue between the child artist's image and the Mahatma's words. There were such unexpected resonances in this regard that it sometimes took my breath away. And I want to just give you, in the interest of time, a couple examples of this. For example, take a look at this painting on the left-hand side of the page, which was done by a young girl called Shubham, studying in ninth standard in GPP High School, Ville Parle. In the, it was a painting titled Gandhi of my imagination. As you can see, Gandhi is walking and talking with a bird. And the bird is also dressed in a Gandhian style dhoti and carrying a stick. When I first saw this painting, I puzzled over it. And I thought, what is the child trying to say and do in this work? What possible incident in Gandhi's life has sparked this imagination in the child? Years of immersing myself in the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi, which is what we historians do, brought me to the letter that I have reproduced on the right-hand side of the page. Gandhi, in fact, I began to realize frequently wrote letters to children in which he referred to them as birds. And here he is in this letter, which he wrote from prison actually, referring to them as birds and pointing out to them that birds are real birds when they can, uh, 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 they can fly without wings. And he's asking them to soar. He's asking them to reach into their uh, uh, minds and live the best of their lives. He refers to names of specific children in this letter and so on. Another favorite set of uh, paintings of mine from the Mani Bhavan collection is shows Gandhi uh, playing cricket. Now we know historically he never did that. In fact, he had some critical comments about cricket. He preferred all manner of indigenous sports, as you know. But of course, the child of today is a, you know, the Indian child loves cricket. So they have, of course, have their Bapu playing cricket. They also have him riding a bicycle and so on. In particular, I wanted to draw attention to this particular painting done by a young girl called Pavitra, which to me, in a few words, captures the essence of Gandhian style disobedience. You can see that uh, Gandhi is holding a bat. On the bat are written the words nonviolence. He's 
tossing the ball called England out of the cricket ground, but also, of course, out of India. And I love the quote that the child has added, you make rules, we break them. To me, that is actually a wonderful instance of the Gandhian style disobedience. A final example that I've included in the album um, is this one, uh, which I also love, done by Krupa, a student of Standard 10th in 2006. As we know, Gandhi gave up most of his material possessions, but he loved his watch and watches in general. Um, and the, this, this child, of course, has drawn uh, a watch. And of course, she's also drawn in the Gandhi's favorite uh, 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 three monkeys into this, into this painting. But for me, once I looked at this painting, it took me back to the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi to find a resonant piece of writing by Gandhi. And I then placed it in dialogue with this painting. And it really captures a wonderful essence of Gandhian thought. God is a wonderful watchmaker. He alone can set right his watch that has gone out of order. Now, one of the big surprises of this project as I was doing it was to realize that the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi, these thousands and thousands of words of Gandhi uh, embodied in 99 volumes of the, of the series, is actually a major repository of the children's voice as well. It is a critical archive of what children thought and wrote and thought about, at least in relationship to Gandhi. We often get their names, their ages, something of their identity, but also a sense of their anxieties and their desires. Some of these I have sought to capture both in the album as well as the larger website. I want to end with a closing image actually here of the album. Um, oh, sorry. which is a, you know, this is a child, of course, Gandhi is bidding us goodbye in the album. And I have included here a letter written by Willie Saville, a young child, a young boy that Gandhi met in London, who wrote a wonderful letter about his experience of meeting Gandhi, which I have included in the album. Um, for a historian, you know, who, uh, for historians who work on childhood in India, where the archives are so scarce, uh, I would like to argue that Gandhi himself, or at least the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi, are a major, major archive for any of us working on, on the child. Gandhi himself, therefore, becomes an important archivist of sorts of children's experiences. Now, I want to conclude uh, by taking you out of the album back to the website. As I said, uh, the, uh, album, uh, the album actually re resides on a, a very basic website that you know, I hope you'll be able to see on your mobile phone, on iPads, but really can be seen very nicely on a desktop. It runs on a WordPress uh, site, which is hosted on the Duke server. And what I have tried to do in the album to flesh out for those who want to delve deeper into the project, uh, I fleshed out many parts of it in two sections. In the section called About the Ch a Project, I have actually included four subchapters, very short introductions. This is a chapter which included, include, introduces you to the importance of money, Bowen. It has photographs, live photographs taken from 2017 of the children assembling in Mani Bhavan's rooms to paint, and it makes a general argument about the competitions themselves. I have also included a conceptual argument here on why the child is important to the father, making of the father of the nation. I have also a section here on some famous Indian artists who grew up as children learning to paint the, uh, the Mahatma, uh, including his own grand nephew, Dhiren Gandhi. And this is uh, a section that ends with Emma Hussain's paintings, because Hussain, the famous artist, was uh, a big fan of Gandhi's. And this was something he tells us in his works, in his autobiography, that he was attracted to Gandhi from the time he was a child. And then the last seg seg section of this subsection includes uh, paintings in well-known works of art in which the child occurs. 
flickers in and out of these paintings. And this section in particular ends with the paintings of uh, Atul Dodia, a wonderful, amazing Mumbai artist who needs no introduction at all to this audience in whose paintings also the child recurs, especially in Dodia's magnificent Bako series, which is an, a die, set up as a dialogue between the child and uh, uh, Gandhi. Then there is a section called Learn More in which different sec checks and sections of the album. If you want to learn more about it, you can click on a hyperlink in the album. It will take you to this section and you can see it picks up on the many themes of the album and elaborates further for those of you who want to learn more. I want to conclude by taking you to the section called Pinching Salt, which is uh, to, uh, uh, since I talked about that. And since this evening began in Mani Bhavan with the beautiful music concert, I want to end my formal presentation also with a small hymn uh, from a video called Namrata Ke Sagar. Uh, and we hear the very well-known hymn attributed to Gandhi in the beautiful voice of Bhim, Pandit Bhim Singh Joshi.
I'll stop there and say thank you very much. Thank you. Such a wonderful presentation. Uh, it's something quite amazing that such an original and innovative concept was converted into a reality by Professor Sumati Ramswami. Thank you, Sumati, so much for this wonderful presentation and your commentary. This program would not have been possible, but for the children who made those paintings, for them, but for their parents who encouraged them and teachers who guided them, and of course the judges who had judged the competitions and selected those things, from which Sumati got her raw material and which she has so fascinatingly made into such a wonderful book. Now, the problem was the pandemic. In the pandemic times, we could not have held such a wonderful program and such a wonderful presentation, but for the technology and the technological hand that we received from primarily two individuals, our friends Rajesh Shinde and Vishwash Patwardhan. I thank them sincerely for the wonderful work that they've done for us. And of course, Mani Bhavan and Gandhi Smarak Nidhi Mumbai has a very dedicated staff which you know, leaves no turn, no stone unturned to make everything feasible and everything possible. Professor Sumathi has already included their names in the acknowledgements, but it's my duty to thank them profusely for the wonderful work that they've been doing. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining this evening and making this program a success. Thanks, sir. Thank you all very much. Okay, so we leave now.